Thank you, thank you very much. If you look at our history of people on Earth, we have always been fascinated by the moon. Right? It's light up there, we can almost reach it, but it's mystical. And it's been only until like, the recent century that we've been able to actually stand on it. Uh, I had the privilege to visit the Houston Space Center and to visit all the stuff that helped put mankind on the moon. And I was expecting to see like, high-tech things, like Star Trek, next generation, spaceship things. And in reality, it's a lot of uh, leather straps, aluminum things that look like medieval torture devices and not, uh, not some spacecraft. The, the space shuttle is also a lot of buttons, no fancy UI, and so on and so forth. So we as developers also like to chase like, new, wonderful, shiny things. But in reality, we can also go with some very old and proven techniques that we can use. For example, if we take a language like Lua uh, that's been developed for, since 1993, we can do a lot of stuff there. So let me talk a little bit about Lua today. Lua means actually the moon in Portuguese. Uh, it was created in Brazil and it was created as a multi-paradigm language uh, designed primarily for the embedded use. Multi-paradigm means that you can do it in an object-oriented way, functional, pro procedural, whatever it takes. It's a cross-platform language. Uh, its interpreter, interpreter is written in, uh, in C, and it's compiled to only 240 uh, kilobytes, which is pretty small, and you can put it anywhere. It doesn't have many features because its intent was speed, portability, and ease of use. So it does have a mechanism for you to extend it, and it's left for developers to implement what they need. So where can you find Lua? Um, you can find Lua in a lot of softwares. Uh, for example, if you ever used Lightroom and you had to do some external plugins, Lua was there. Uh, it, if you had to re export some, something to your, uh, to your management via uh, Workbench and you had some like, pretty weird systems, had to do some, some modifications to the export, you probably did it with, with Lua. Uh, if you played, analyzed any kind of network protocol that is not supported, Lua was there. And in many, many games, if you wanted to do some hacks or if you wanted to be like an indie developer and develop your own games, you probably used uh, Lua as a, as a game engine. So as I mentioned, Lua was, is uh, very light in features, um, features that can be extended to solve different problems instead of giving you the exact specification or pattern how to use it. It's dynamic, dynamically typed, which you're probably used to uh, right now. And it has a little, uh, a f a little few uh, atomic structures and even less of compound structures. And the great thing is that these functions are first-class first class citizens in Lua, so they can be used um, directly as well. So if we compare it a little bit to, uh, to a PHP, we all know the uh, simple data types in PHP. Well, Lua has all of them, just the numbers are compressed into, into a single one. If we look at the more complex uh, data structures in Lua, we only have tables and functions. As I, men as I mentioned, functions are first-class citizens, citizens, and table is this uh, very, very versatile mechanism, so you can implement both the arrays and objects and a lot of other things with that. I will show you later how. And for the special, special types, uh, you have nil type in Lua, and you have user data if you want to access memory directly and talk with uh, C-level functions and, uh, of course, some threads. So other features would include having the coercion. Coercion is like a real fancy word for comparing strings and integers. So if you want to compare string one to integer one, that will work in Lua, something that we are also used to. I didn't know the coercion is a word for that until I did this talk, so I um, learn something as well. 
Uh, you also have coroutines for that, threads and all that fancy stuff, and uh, a good garbage collection. So at the first glance, if you look at Lua, you, you could say, hey, you mentioned that you can do object oriented programming in, in Lua, but there are no classes, there are no namespaces, there are no inheritance. So let's look, for example, how to do, how to do objects, how to create a class in, 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 in PHP and how to create it in Lua. It does a little bit com complex, and maybe at the first, if you never use Lua, it looks like an overkill, but with use of meta tables, uh, you can actually get that. Um, same wise, if you need like inheritance, you can use tables, tables for that as well, and say, hey, I need namespaces. Um, here are the namespaces also. For example, uh, if you import other packages, they are also going to be represented as tables. So this table thing is very, very versatile. And since we talk a lot about how uh, it's small and embeddable, this is like the complete standard library of Lua. Um, you, can, you have like a, a base thing of base functions and package management. Uh, you can do also starts with, uh, with strings, UTF-8 compatible. Uh, there's table math. You can input, output, access the OS, and debug. That's about it. So there's not a lot of things of going on. Um, this was a shocker for me at first, especially when I looked into, into certain libraries. I mean, take a look, for example, into PHP array library. These are all the functions that you can use to manipulate arrays. I'm sure you know at least a dozen of them. And I know that you need to look into documentation for the next dozen to see if the needle goes first or the haystack. And there are some that were like, completely different to you. In Lua, it's a completely different thing. These are the methods that we can use on table. So we can just glue everything together, add stuff, remove stuff, find out how long it is, and sort. That's it. Feels scary at first, but in reality, it really is not. When looking into a new language, it's also a good thing to look at the ecosystem that language is in. So if we take a look at Lua, we should first take a look at TOB index. If you don't know what TOB index is, it's a programming community index that's been published every month. Uh, we use it as an indicator of how popular programming language is. They do ratings uh, based on number of engineers in the world, uh, number of uh, vendors, and they take in account how many results are there on the Google and other search engines. Uh, so you get a number that you can, that you can compare to. Uh, the beginning of that thing is, is always reserved for Java, C, C++, and Visual Basic because a majority of software is still written in those languages, and PHP is currently ranking ninth. And then when you go to uh, like less popular languages like, like Rust, Haskell, Clojure, uh, you see Lua there as well. So it really, really ranks in the lower part of the index but that's really not that big of a deal. If you do a search in GitHub by language semicolon Lua, you'll find that there are like 60,000 repositories compared to PHP. Yeah, that's quite a setback, uh, but in reality, everything you need to find for your web development is there. And also, if you need help, there is Stack Overflow. The difference is maybe great for every question there is in Lua. There are 100 more questions in, in PHP. But when I'm stuck and I Google, uh, I usually find what I need. Developing in Lua doesn't mean that you need to use the text editor. There's no notepad, and there's uh, like full-blown development environments. Uh, Zero Brain Studio, for example, is devoted solely to Lua. Uh, PHP developers usually perform IntelliJ uh, because they're used to hold the workflow and they have pretty good support with, with Lua. The text editors like Atom and Sublime have plugins. If you try to work with some framework in Lua or some, some like popular libraries, there are even packages uh, that will enable functionality, for example, like like you have with Neos and PHP Storm and Symfony and so on, uh, you have that as well in, in, uh, in all these development environments. Also, 
Uh, every modern language needs a package, package management. Uh, we have Lua rocks. Um, coming from Composer to Lua rocks is a bit of a letdown. You always feel like you're naked, you're missing a lot of things. But it's not because the Lua rocks is bad. It just proves that Composer is one of the best uh, package management, management tools uh, out there. Again, looking into what packages are available, there are a lot of packages available in the, in the Lua rocks. Uh, have in mind that Lua is not web development language only. You can do, uh, like I mentioned, games and many other things uh, in Lua. But if you just filter out and see uh, the technologies and servers that you would like to connect to through Lua, the packages are already written. So there is really, really no need for you to roll your own, except if you're working for some like obscure piece of software, then you're probably going to have to write something, uh, something yourself. So with all that in mind, we have like enough stuff to go on uh, and to build our uh, bar thing. Um, how many of you use Redis? Do you use Redis for more than just caching? Do anybody use this as a single database store? Yeah, Redis is pretty, pretty great. I mean, um, it's been voted as the most loved database for three years in a row, and it's a like, pretty good accomplishment. My relationship with Redis started as, hey, I'll just use it for a cache because it's in memory, it's fast, and then I progressed to uh, all of other things. Um, if you've never seen Redis in action, it's uh, in memory, data structure store, Mon most common use is like cache because it's like pretty, pretty fast. So if you need to cache your database calls or some calculated output, it's really easy. It has a lot of uh, data types that you can use, a lot of complex data types. For example, if you want to lose lists or sorted stats, uh, if you do any geolocations uh, calculations, you can have geospatial uh, types. So it's really, really powerful. If you want to use it as a message broker, there are pub sub patterns. There is uh, in version 5 streams. So it's really, really, really powerful. And also, and that's why we're here, it supports Lua scripting. So with Lua scripts, you have that Redis's uh, promise of atomicity. That means that no other script or Redis command will be executed while your script is being run. So with that in mind, just be aware of the slow scripts. We don't want to do that. Uh, inside of the script, you can access Redis itself by do, doing a Redis call. You can learn a little bit about conversion between data types because Lua can't handle nil values in terms of its unsets. So you have to know how to, how to handle that. Uh, there are no global values. And based on your interpreter, all the libraries that we mentioned are out there are in there, and it's upgraded with a couple of more libraries to have uh, message packing. So you have JSON and message pack. OK, let's, let's build some software. Um, back in the day, I used to play uh, these games, console games, like the real ones. And let's say we want to build the high score system for uh, one of those. OK, uh, let's, let's build the API for that. So we'll probably want to do something like that. We want to post the high score that our player made, and we're going to give it a name, and we're going to give some score. And in response, I would like to receive that name, and I want to receive the position that player got. So how to do that with the Lua in Redis? We can create a simple script, simple script that will go on and make a Redis call to our structured set. Uh, we provide the key name where we are going to set it. Couple of arguments. The first argument is going to be a score. Second argument is going to be the uh, username. And then after setting, we are going to ask Redis, hey, what's the rank of, the, uh, of that username? Uh, the rev rank is because we want to get the highest score. And because it's uh, zero indexed, we just increase it by one. So we have the script. We should now probably run it inside of Redis. And what I'm about to show you, it's going to be a little bit scary because we learned that this command is like really, really dangerous. So don't be scared. We're going to evaluate. 
So to eval Lua script in Redis, just pull up your favorite client, give it a string that contains the script itself, tell him how many keys are out there. We're going to use the high score key and pass it the score and the username. So it kind of parses into, into script like this. Uh, it may seem like an overkill, and yes, inside of the script, you could use those uh, key values hard-coded directly, but in this way, if you transfer your application from one Redis server to a cluster, this will still work. So when designing Lua scripts, think more about helper scripts, little scripts. Do not try to build the next big framework inside of the Lua, inside of the Redis, because it will be too much. Um, if you need to do something and log something in Redis, Lua is pretty great. Uh, all sorts of statistic stuff like averages, mean values, things like that, that you can do in one pass, in one call to Redis, is pretty, pretty good candidate. And all those transaction-like things, uh, like, for example, when Redis first came out, uh, you could not set a key and set ex expire. You had to make, like, two... Um, two Redis calls, so uh, Lua scripts were used for that. And of course, as more things become Redis na native, um, you can do, do it like directly. So enough about, enough about Redis. Um, another piece of, of software that I personally use, and I presume that a lot of you use it as well, is, is Nginx. Um, my relationship with Nginx is like similar with Lua. It came to my life step by step. Um, at first, Apache was like the main driving force of PHP. And then people said, hey, but we can use Redis because it's fast to serve static files. So you had like Redis in front, serving status files, and then transferring all the PHP requests to Apache server with PHP that processed the content. And eventually, the Apache was pushed out of the way, and now the Nginx is the main, main driving force. Uh, you can use it as a proxy server, uh, as a balancer, web server, um, practically anything goes these days. Uh, we use it because it has a very low memory footprint. It's, it's event-driven, and we have a pool of workers. So naturally, we supercharge the Nginx with PHP FPM, and then we have all the benefits of the uh, Nginx plus the shared nothing architecture, so we don't have um, any data between the, between the requests. And we have this synchronous code with blocking I.O. Uh, workers are usually spun during, uh, during start startup, so we don't have the thread, uh, the new process being, uh, being spun for each request, which means stability. But yeah, eventually we can still uh, run out of workers, especially if there's something uh, something blocking its execution. With uh, Nginx, you have similarly everything that you have in, uh, in, 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 uh, in Nginx, but it's, it allows you to share data between requests. It doesn't mean that, you, that the data is leaking like all the time. The, the, there's no like, global namespace that you should be uh, afraid of. You have to like specify specifically a dictionary and say, hey, yes, this is going to be shared between, between our workers. So you define it there. And you have this non-blocking I.O. We'll see in a minute how that is really good. So if you want to get started with Nginx and, uh, sorry, with Nginx and Lua, I suggest that you look into OpenResty. OpenResty is a bundle. It's not a fork of Nginx. It's a bundle that contains Nginx, Lua JIT, and a couple of those uh, modules that we, are, we that we are going to use. Um, it leverages the event model and the non-blocking I/O. So all those modules that you have for like memcached, MySQL, Redis, uh, for web sockets and everything are going to be are going to be non-blocking. If we analyze the workflow of Nginx, like what happens between the request and response. We first have the rewrite phase, where we rewrite the URL to a specific location, and then the access phase, where we determine is access allowed on that location. We check for restrictions. Then we generate some content, and with PHP, we 
pass that on to PHP FPM to generate string and then report back to us, and we'll output that to the client. And if everything is successful, we log it as a success, or we log an error message. So for each of those uh, very simplified phases, I know there are a couple of more, but um, these are like the main, main ones, we have a Lua phase that we can connect to. So for each phase, there is a by Lua block or by Lua file that we can provide our, our file. So it's really, really nice. And if we go back to our example, if we take a look at our game, now we want to fetch the, for example, top 10 count. OK? So we'll get, A, hey, what are the high scores? So in order to receive something like this, let's see how we can create it in, in Lua and NGX. So we'll probably define some sort of configuration for high scores. We're going to say, I'm going to be returning the JSON format. And there's content by Lua block. And inside of that Lua block, we'll put the Lua script. We're going to ask to require both JSON and Redis, because that's what we are going to use. We are going to connect to Redis, and we are going to ask Redis for a Z rev range to give us the uh, sorted set for our scores together with, uh, together with names and give us the top 10. So this, this is going to return the, uh, the uh, array with 20 elements. Elements being contained, uh, elements being uh, your name, score, name, score, and so on. So we just have to uh, loop through that to create some more compact structure. And we're going to do that in the for loop. And then in the end, we're just going to pack it into a JSON and output it. So if you think of possible usages uh, for Nginx and Lua, I'd rather you think of a, use it to check permissions for maybe access rate throttling. Um, if you want to manipulate headers, if you use Nginx as a proxy um, proxy server, you can just easily replace all the HTTP links with the HTTPS in, in, uh, on the fly. Um, you can avoid application calls to, um, to the application. Uh, you can fetch it directly from, from some storage, like we did this in, the, in this example. Uh, if you want to format your log into JSON, you can do it as well. You can even add cookie information. You can send everything to your Elastic Kibana stack, and you'll have a lot of, lot of good, uh, good stuff there. So you're probably wondering how performant is that, right? You think that we could really, really benefit of not using our application every single time. So if we want to do a A-B test on our, uh, on our application, uh, for the test purposes, I use the like, low budget version. I spend five bucks on a DigitalOcean instance. So there's only one core and half a gigabyte of RAM. And from a different uh, machine, I said, hey, I'm going to use uh, 100 concurrent connections, and let's uh, make 50,000 connections to the server. Can anyone guess how many requests per second can we handle? You can just shout. Give me a number. I, I won't leave until somebody screams. Two, Two OK. <laughs> Have little faith. Come on. Yeah, shout it. 100? 500? Uh, thank you for being optimistic. Yeah? Sorry? Two million. Two million. Yeah, thank you. Not that many, but uh, let's see. So this is the, the response from the AB. And if you take a look, we got 2,000 requests per, per second. And that's, that's really, really is great. Uh, if you want to look at the distribution uh, of those numbers, we had a luck, 80% of the request finishing up in uh, like 40 milliseconds, and then more percentage was finished like really fast, and the last one was just there like to mess up with my statistics. Um, so in general, it is really, really, really fast, and while the test was running, 
I could use the server normally, so it was not not uh, lagging. The CPU had still uh, plenty of time to go to. OK, playtime is over. Uh, we build a lot of stuff with Lua. We saw how we can use it with, uh, with Redis. We saw how we can use it in Nginx. Um, if you've been to a talk in this room before about JavaScript, you will see that a lot of stuff is like really, really similar. I always joke uh, that Lua is what JavaScript should have looked like in summary. It took more than 10 days to think about uh, how to create it. So yeah, if you overslept the whole, uh, whole presentation, uh, I would kindly ask you that, yeah, before you go home, uh, just consider that there are other languages out there. I mean, I like about the Neos community because it's so tight together and really enjoys working on that product. But don't be those developers that only do stuff in a framework they are used to, in a language they are used to. I mean, if I said, hey, can you, bring me, can you build me the, the blacklist for your application based on API, you would probably go jump right in and build it for me. And it's like an easy, simple programming task that everybody would like and that everybody would enjoy working on. But there are some better tools for that. Uh, better yet, do it in Lua, for example, and do it in the access phase in the Nginx so we don't even have to touch the database itself. We don't even have to touch the, the application. It, be, it will be much, much faster. So don't be like those, uh, like those race horses, you know, the, when they have the blind side, they just focus on something. Yeah, have broader picture in mind. Experiment a little bit and see what's, what's out there. Thank you very much for being such a lovely audience. I will heartily invite you to come to Zagreb, Croatia. We have a main conference in October. Our call for paper is open. So if you want to spend uh, two days with a lot of web developers, there are like 18, 80, 800 of developers uh, coming there. Please enjoy. And thank you very much for attending. My slides are already pushed to my web page, so you can fetch it from there. Thank you very much.